Revelation 21. I've titled this, Our Citizenship Heaven. This is where we're going. This is where we will spend eternity. And it's a real blessing, and I pray that it, it is uh, an encouragement for you in the same way. Human history begins in a garden, and it ends in a city. And here in chapter 21, what we're going to see is a brand new world. It's one no one's ever seen before. Um, and yet here John records it. So the pages of chapter 21, they open up to us and we get to see a view of what it's going to be like for all of eternity. This is the place that has been prepared for you and I by Jesus Christ. It's the place will spend eternity with him enveloped in his love. We're already past the millennium. We're now stepping into chapter 21. This is where we're going for all of eternity. And it's a real blessing. And if you ever face some real difficult times in your life, pick up Revelation 21 and read it and get a real view of where you're headed for all of eternity. And it kind of puts everything else aside. So I thank you, Lord, that you allow me to be at a place like this. But verse 1, he says, Then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth passed away, and there is no longer any sea. So the first thing John sees here is, is the, a new heaven and a new earth, because the first heaven and the first earth have passed away. And it's pretty wild. He says passed away literally means to perish because of neglect. Not mankind neglecting the earth, but God. In the end, God neglects the very earth that rejected him, and the heavens would be the sky that's there. Uh, the earth would be the earth, the, sky, the heavens would be the sky. Jesus said in Matthew chapter 5, he said, Do not think I've come to destroy the law or the prophets. I've not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For truly I say to you, till the heaven and the earth pass away, not one jolt or one tittle shall in any way pass away from the law until it's fulfilled. Jesus talked about heaven and the earth passing away being neglected by God. In 2 Peter chapter 3, he says, But the day of the Lord will come as a thief in the night, in which the heavens will pass away with a rushing noise, and the elements will melt with fervent heat, and the earth and the works in it will be burned up. Then all these things being dissolved, um, what sort of uh, holy behavior and godliness should we be in, looking and rushing uh, for the day of the, the day of God, on account of which the heavens being on fire will melt away and the elements will melt with burning heat. So the, the earth, the sky, and the sea perish because of neglect, because the world has rejected the only way God made for it to go to him. He's already sent people into the lake of fire. The millennium has passed and all that's left is the earth. And even the earth will pass away and the sky and the sea. And it kind of perishes. Why? Because God is making ready to bring a new one in. Making ready for the new. You know how you say, out with the old, in with the new? God is saying, out with the old, in with the new. And when the new comes in, it's not like the old. It's nothing I can even describe. Because it's not describable. If that's a word, describable. <laughs> Um, God desired to bless the earth, and he said it many times in his word. He told the nation of Israel, you follow my words, you follow my command, I'll make it rain, I'll make the grass grow, I'll make your crops be bumper crops and your animals multiply. But, but when a world rejects Christ and all that's left is a Christ-rejecting world, God can't bless that. You know, as a nation, we used to pray. When I was in school, as a little kid, we used to pray every morning. We used to pray. We used to sing, God bless America. Everybody remember that? And pledging the allegiance to the flag. And then prayer was kicked out of school. And then so 60 years after, the blessing, God's hand of blessing on our nation is gone. He holds on to his people. But the blessing that he blessed our nation with, he's removed it. 
Why? Because our nation as a nation has rejected him and rejected his word. And it started a long time ago. And, and this is a great picture of, of what's going to happen. Even the, the heavens and the earth pass away. They perish because of neglect. Because God said, I cannot bless you. I cannot bless that. And I have to make, take this, move this on to bring in the new. And verse 2, And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, made ready as a bride adorned for her husband. So John looks and then he says, I saw the holy city. And the holy city, holy means the sacred, blameless, and brand new city of God. Descending from heaven is a brand new city, unlike any other city, coming down from heaven, from God. It's blameless. It's spotless. The, this is the new Jerusalem. It's called the city of living hope. It's the city where we will be citizens of forever. And it says, made ready. Made ready literally means internally fit or constructed new from within. God brings it down as a bride adorned for her husband. This is really awesome because it means made one with. It means to embellish with honor for her husband. It speaks of two things, that God honors the bride in such a way that she has received glory and honor from God and she has become this dazzling brilliance. And he's saying, the city came down just like the bride, like the bride before. You know what we're going to look like when we stand before Christ as his bride? It's going to be breathtaking. It's going to be beyond, beyond dazzling and beautiful. That's an amazing, that's all of us together as we unite before God as his bride. And he's saying, it's the city, I saw the city come down, adorned just like the bride. Just adorned and with excellence in that. It also speaks of the faithfulness of the bride in preparing herself to be with her groom. Remember when you first got married? I remember when I first got married, I found my wife's notebook and her name was Kelly Bresnahan. But then in the notebook, it said, uh, Mrs. Ronald Armalette, Mrs. Ronald Armalette, Mrs. Ronald Armalette. And there were like 30 pages. And I'm like, why? Is this normal? Like, yes, it is. Because she doesn't want to be Kelly Bresnahan anymore. She wants to be Mrs. Ronald Armalette. <laughs> I thought that was awesome. And, and what he's saying is, I looked and I saw this new city coming down. Adorned as a bride, faithful, dazzling, magnificent. I remember one time um, I did a wedding up on top of Wyndham Hill. And as the bride is coming down with her father, Barbara's daughter was, Barbara, Jen's, Barbara's daughter Jen, her little daughter was there. And she was a little tyke at the time. And I'll never forget, I'm watching her look at the bride. And if you could have saw her face, it was almost like everything in my life is for that moment. She had this gloried look on her face. And she was watching the, the bride come down. And she was like, one day, like one day, that's going to be me. And I thought, that's amazing. Inbred inside these little girls for that one day. And what a precious day it is. And it's a shame in America today that it's become a joke. Because it is a precious, precious day. And it is a precious, precious bride. And he's saying this city was just like the bride. Coming down beautiful. Then in verse 3, And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, Behold, the tabernacle of God is among men. And he will dwell among them, and they shall be his people. And God himself will be among them. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes, and there will no longer be any death. There will no longer be any mourning or crying or pain. The first things have passed away. And he says, and he who sits on the throne says, Behold, I'm making all things new. And he said, right, for these words are faithful and true. This is an amazing thing that John sees. He sees this beautiful city of God, holy, blameless, spotless, prepared and ready to be with him and his people, coming down from heaven there. And he says, um, 
And I heard a loud voice, and the voice said, The tabernacle of God is among men. And the tabernacle here speaks of the Shekinah glory, the home of the Shekinah glory of God. The divine majesty of God is now among men. And you know what? Will permanently now be among men. The Shekinah glory will never leave again. Remember in the Old Testament, the Shekinah glory left? Why? Because man sinned and lived in sin. And the glory of God departed. Well, not here. When that holy city comes down, the Shekinah glory is dwelling in the center of it. And, and he will dwell among us and we will be with him forever. Everything we look at in this chapter is eternal. Forever. This is where we're going. A brilliance, a, a beautiful brilliance that's there. And it says, he wipes away every tear, so there'll be no sorrow of any kind will ever enter within the walls of the city. Imagine if you could say that about your home. Never again will sorrow enter this house. That means it'll be there this afternoon. Watch out. Why? Because we're just human. I mean, how many people go from church to church to church looking for the perfect church? I went to that church and I found sorrow. Oh, sorry, you're human. I mean, like it's called life. But when we get there, our tears will be wiped away. There will be no sorrow ever found in that place. The, the cry of, of anguish shall never be spoken. Hearts will never be broken. No tear shall ever dim the eye. And most glorious of all, death shall be unknown. That's where we're headed to. And there's a tremendous blessing in that. The new Jerusalem will be painless, tearless, and deathless because it will be a sinless city. Why? He says, the former things have passed away. What you knew and known your whole life is gone. Now we step into something new that will never be altered again. And it will never be altered by pain, sorrow, sin, or death. Can you imagine that? I can't even imagine that. But man, I look forward to it. Look forward to a time where my body won't hurt anymore, or my feelings won't be crushed, or, or whatever the case is. Um, he, he, he makes all things new, it says. And when it says that he makes all things new, it speaks of both the body and the soul becoming brand new. Literally, like not renovated or renewed, um, but, uh, but glorious, in new, a glorious new soul and body, one that we can't even comprehend right now. I think something that, that we uh, try to think of and we won't understand it, but we'll be a part of it then. But what we get is a brand new soul, a brand new body, one that's unlike one we'll ever know. And it will glory in the Lord. And we will all be a part of that. You wonder why we praise his name for eternity. Because we look at all that we are now and how we think and how we feel and what we face. And then to get there and to have that all gone and to begin anew, to be made new. There's something that's, that's a blessing. Uh, that's why God wants everybody there. In, in uh, verse 6, then he said to me, it is done. I am the Alpha and the Omega, the beginning and the end. I will give to the one who thirsts from the spring of the water of life without costs. This is pretty awesome. Um, he said, it is done, which means it is finished. It means it's now complete. What Jesus first said on the cross, it is finished, has now been brought. What was finished was salvation was then offered to mankind through the death of Jesus Christ on the cross. But what brings it to completion is when we are with him for eternity and, and heaven and earth pass away and every lost sinner is cast into the lake of fire with Satan, it's complete. And that's what he means here. You know, when Jesus was on the cross... Um, well, before, even before he was on the cross, he said, I have finished the work you have given me to do. Like tomorrow morning, I'm going to die. And I've completed everything you've wanted me to do. And I will face this cross 
tomorrow and on it I will say it is finished but it won't be completed what's finished is my salvation done forgiven washed clean but when it's complete then I will be with him there for all of eternity the millennium's done all that God had purposed and planned providentially by his own mighty hand and his word is completed and the new heaven the new Jerusalem comes down and, and that's what he means right there and he says, I will give, um, you know, to anyone who thirsts, to the one who thirsts, the spring of the water of life and, and the handing out of that. Uh, he, he will become the refreshment and satisfaction for all who thirst. That's what he's showing. You know, we can look to him right now and say, you're my satisfaction. You quench my thirst. And for many of us, he does. And then tomorrow hits and I get a call out again. Lord, quench my thirst. Be the satisfaction of my life. I had to face life again. I had to face myself. I had to face today. I had to face tomorrow. See me through this. And yet there, he will, for eternity, be the refreshment and satisfaction for all who thirst. Because he alone is the Lamb of God that takes away the sin of the world, and anyone who comes to him for this salvation, he promises, will receive it. He will give to them without cost. He will pardon them of all sin and the guilt and the shame that sin births. He will cover them from the wrath of God on the day when God judges the sins of the world. He alone is our pardon of grace and mercy from God. And what he wants you to know is that he is. That's what he is. This is not, he didn't come to start a religious work. He didn't come to birth a denomination. He came to give you and I life, his life, so we could get through this, this world, sharing his life with others, this good news that God had sent salvation through Christ, sharing that with everybody that we know, and then trusting in him as we go each and every day to get through this. And then what is he? he we find out, Lord, in the end, everything you said was true. I know everybody pretty much in this room, and I believe you believe the word of God. But I believe, like me, sometimes you doubt. Sometimes you face this wall. Lord, is this really true? Really? What if, what if, what if? Let's just say, it's not. What then? How do I face tomorrow? How do I face today? So gonna, the answer is always the same. Look to me and trust me by faith. I didn't ask you to walk by sight. I didn't ask you to walk by feelings and emotions. I asked you, I told you, commanded you, walk by faith in what my son has done for you. And walk that faith out because when we get there, we, faith won't be needed. He will be ours and we will be his for all of eternity. And there's, a, there's a great picture painted there uh, for us to see. Look at verse 7. Uh, I mean, yeah, seven and eight. He who overcomes will inherit these things, and I will be his God, and he will be my son. But for the cowardly and unbelieving and abominable and murderers, immoral persons and sorcerers, idolaters and all liars, their part will be in the lake that, that burns with fire and brimstone, he says, which is the second death. So you, he goes on there, you know, explaining this is who Jesus is. And then he says, to he who overcomes will inherit these things. The term overcomes means to prevail. And to prevail here means to gain victory by faith in Christ alone. We prevail. We press on in spite of all that we face. By faith, Jesus is victorious over sin and death and has offered me pardon for all of eternity and I believe that by faith. Faith in him, trusting him in his word and getting up and moving forward in all that he wants me to do because he has given me faith to trust him for that. And that's overcoming right there. 
who, who presses on in spite of the circumstances or even the consequences of the situation before them, finding out that each and every day, Lord, you know what I've come to find out? Your grace is definitely sufficient for me. It was sufficient to carry me through yesterday. And I didn't think it was going to. And I, it will be sufficient to carry me through today. That's your promise. And it's learning that, that his grace is sufficient. Isn't it? He say, in, in my weakness, he is strong. How many men want to be weak? We teach our children from the time they're little boys to be strong. You want to be strong. No, no guy ever teaches a son, listen, what you want to do as you grow up, be weak. Let them step all over you. Let them mock you and ridicule you. No, we say, defend yourself, fight for yourself, beat up that bully. And yet, when I'm facing situations in my life, faith in Christ gets challenged. And when it gets challenged, he's saying, my grace is sufficient for you. You walk in weakness here. I can't tell you how many times I want to take over a situation and not leave it in the hands of the Lord. I know how to take care of this. I know how to work this out. Lord, thank you for giving me the wisdom on how to handle this myself. God's like, I did. You trust me by faith. Walk down that road. Even if you're mocked and ridiculed, walk down that road and trust me. You know, we had prayer this morning before we will come up the, um, to, to the service. And uh, Pete had mentioned um, John Chapman. And John Chapman was, was an incredible uh, missionary who shared the gospel everywhere he went. He was born in Lemison, Massachusetts, our hometown. And he was one of the greatest evangelists in the United States of America. And he went out sharing the gospel with everybody. And every single person he shared it with despised him. The only thing they liked about him was his apples. He was called Johnny Appleseed. And that's where he came from. But not just planting apples. He shared the gospel. He shared Christ everywhere he went. And people despised him. And he went all over the eastern part of the United States. Sharing and, and, and just passing on. Indians ended up getting saved because of him. And that's an amazing thing. He stepped out. You know what? In my weakness, he is strong. And it will always be that way. So through faith in Christ, we gain the victory. But he says here, you know, the faithless, really the disbelieving, those who love the disgust of the world, I guess you could say the intentional murderer, the fornicator. You have the, the sorcerer. Um, the sorcerer would be the, the, those, the one who poisons the human soul. That would be the drug user and the seller. Those who worship idols and love deception. He says, they shall have their part in the lake of fire, which is the second death. You know, Jesus died for the sake of humanity's freedom from the bondage of sin. He lived a sinless life. He suffered a wrongful death. And by the power of God, he rose again from the dead, becoming for anyone who would trust and believe in him the full payment and full pardon of all sin in their lives. And when he did that, he promises then eternal life. Now listen, eternal life, either eternal life in a lake of fire for all who would reject him, or eternal life with him in this new Jerusalem for all who would trust him. And that trust is by faith alone. That's how we get in, and that's how we stay with him forever. But that eternal life is offered to all people. There's only two places. One is a lake of fire, and one's eternally with him in this new heavens, uh, this new Jerusalem that's going to come down. Jesus Christ is the Alpha and the Omega. He's the beginning and the end. He's the Son of God. He's the King of Kings. He's the Lord of Lords. He's the Messiah. He's Jehovah, the Prince of Peace. He's the Son of Man. He's the Seed of Abraham. And He's the second person in the Trinity. And you can trust what He says will come to pass. 
That is a guarantee because it's not some made up thing uh, from that, that men make up. Then in verse 9, um, down through the rest of the chapter, we're going to see the new Jerusalem. He says in verse 9, Then one of the seven angels who had the seven bowls full of the seven last plagues came and spoke with me, saying, Come here, and I will show you the bride, the wife of the Lamb. And he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me the holy city Jerusalem coming down out of heaven from God, having the glory of God. So, so here's John, he's there. Now he sees the new Jerusalem and it starts to come down. And, and he says, you know, the angels there, one of them can come, I'll show you the bride, the wife of the lamb. Which is pretty wild because it says he spoke to me. He said, come here. So the term he spoke to me, it means as one friend talks to another. He spoke to me as a friend. From one friend to another. That's really important. And he says, come here. It means come along with me. I got something to show you. I'm going to show you the bride of the wife of the lamb. It means the completed and prepared bride. And what you see here, John has shown the holy city, the new Jerusalem, and she's called the bride of Christ. And she's called the bride of Christ because this is the city where all of God's people will be gathered together for all of eternity. The city is brilliant and dazzling and the bride is brilliant and dazzling. And it's so breathtaking, really, um, he says, you know, Come with me. He's carried away because, because the bride in the New Jerusalem is too brilliant to look at close up. So he says, come with me. Get away. Look at this from afar. And he looks at just this dazzling, magnificent brilliance of the New Jerusalem, like the bride of Christ, he says. Um, very strong and very important there. And then in verse 11, having the glory of God. Real important there because it speaks of a relationship. It literally means accompanied through relationship, God's glory. It means that we, the bride, will be so fitted together through relationships, eternally radiating the glory of God. So it's not going to be my brilliance shining. It's going to be the glory of God radiating between you and I and our relationship. I want you to think of something real important. When a husband and wife truly love each other and they walk together, no words have to be spoken. And guess what everybody sees? That they love each other. And when a husband and wife despise each other, no words have to be spoken. What does everybody know? That they despise each other. And our relationships are going to be so united in the glory of God in this new city that our relationships together sparkle a dazzling brilliance that shines out through all of eternity. This is where we're going. You wonder why God says that our fellowship is so important. Don't make fellowship some kind of church social club. Because now you're lacking in the relationship part of just how important it is for the world to see. When I, when I come into this fellowship and I love you the way Christ loves me and you love me the same way, what does the world see without a word being spoken? They see the love of God flowing between people. You know what they say? I want that. I want that in my marriage. I want that in my family. I want that in my life. And that's just a small tip of the iceberg about of how it's going to be when we get there. Because there'll be no sin at all complicating it. Nothing at all. It's going to be pure and awesome, and it's going to be a tremendous blessing. Uh, we will have eternal, constant relationships with each other and with God. And you know what will never be? You will never be alone. Anybody here ever been alone? You understand it? You don't like it, do you? It stinks. And God is saying, I want you to know something. When you come be with me, when the millennium's all over, and I put you together with, with my bride, 
and I present you to myself in this new Jerusalem, you will never, ever, ever for eternity be alone. And that's a tremendous blessing because I can't tell you how many people today commit suicide because they have no hope, because they're alone, because they can't face the day. And yet God is saying, look to where you're going and know that you will never be alone, ever. And our relationship with each other and with God will radiate His glory for eternity. You know what that means? Our relationships will, will be living active, tangible, in eternal relationships. I don't know what we'll be doing, but we will be actively doing it, that's for sure. And we'll do it together for the glory of God. That's just an awesome picture painted there. Look at verse 11 again, for having the glory of God. Her brilliance was like very costly stone, as, as a stone of crystal, uh, crystal clear jasper. It had a great high wall with 12 gates, and at the gates, 12 angels, and the names were written on them, which were the names of the 12 tribes of the sons of Israel. And there were three gates on the east and three gates on the north, three gates on the south and three gates on the west. And the wall of the city had 12 foundation stones and on them were the 12 names of the 12 apostles of the Lamb. This is an amazing thing. This is a, uh, a, a, an enormous city, and this is a brilliant city looking at it. In fact, he says it's brilliance, very costly stones. It just means it, it, it's illuminating the glory of God and his preciousness, just like precious stones radiate a glory. And he's saying this is what's, what's happening here. And it, and it speaks of the, the very deep, unsearchable thoughts of God towards us. You know what's going to happen? God has some very, very deep, unsearchable thoughts towards you and I. And at that time, we will know them all. Nothing will be hidden. We'll know. Now, you never think sometimes, I know God loves me, but does he like me? Because, you know, I know he loves me and that's important. But I don't think he likes me because I'm, I'm not a good person. And really, uh, and, and yet God's saying, I love you. Do you think I'm kidding? Do you think like I'm, I'm a human being and like that's all. And so I love you until you do me wrong and then I'm going to hate you. No, I love you. In fact, you can't see it right now. But when you get to this city, that's my promise. You will see the very deep thoughts of my mind and my heart towards you. And you're going to find out I never stopped loving you. That you have always been precious to me like a precious stone, like a crystal or a ruby or a diamond. That's how I view you. And we're going to be utterly amazed at God's love for us. If you're utterly amazed at his love for you now. You will be, it'll blow your mind when you see his love for you and what it has been all this time. And you have these gates. They got names written on the gates and the walls. The names of the 12 tribes of Israel. The names of the 12 apostles. It's just showing that God will never forget the heritage of his people and the truth they carried around in this world. God called Abraham, and from Abraham, the whole Jewish race was created. And from them, he gave them his ordinances and his precepts and his word and says, carry around, because that word one day is going to become flesh and walk among you and lay down his life for you. The sacrificial system that you follow each and every day, that in every year that you do this, it's going to become real in, in me. You're carrying me to show me to the world. And God says, I'll never forget the names of the heritage of my people and the 12 apostles because they were, the, they were found the foundation of the eternal testimony that was brought to the whole world. This is Christ. What the Jews carried became flesh and here he is. He died for us. The message I carry right now is the message of the apostles and the message of the Old Testament saints in one. We go to the Old Testament, we find out this is a picture of what's coming. We go to the New Testament, we say, he's come. This is Christ. It's God's showing. He's coming. He's coming. He'll forgive your sins. 
He'll wash you clean. He'll wipe away your shame and your guilt. And then the New Testament says the apostles carried the message. He has come. Receive him. It's, it's finished. He's come. And so God makes their names on, on the gates and the corners and the walls that are up there. So here in this chapter, you know, God is showing us what he truly thinks of us. He loves you and I, desires for us to be with him in this place, to be a part of this city for all of eternity. That's his desire. He's showing you and I here that this is the stability of our trusting his ways, and it's the security of where we're going. And the truth is, our language is inadequate to explain and express the beauty and truth that's embedded in this description of the New Jerusalem. In fact, the truth of God's word uh, will never pass away. Uh, the faith and hope and love that we have will never pass away. It'll endure and go on. It'll, it'll endure beyond dying, uh, beyond temporary and God is saying, words can't even describe. So John's writing down what he's seeing. And he hands it for us. And this is not for the unbelieving. This is for the believing. To say, Lord, I can get through this day. I can get through this year. I can press on. I can take one more step. I can take one more step. I can take one more step. Why? Because I know where I'm going. And I know I'm going to be with you. And when I get there, there'll be no tears. Maybe I'm crying now. Maybe I'm hurting now. Maybe I'm facing difficulty now. But I'm going to take another. I'm going to press on and I'm not going to give up. Because I'm going to press on and press on. Why? By faith in Christ, I know where I'm going. And I am looking forward to going there. And the truth is, how can our everyday language even express the reality that's beyond the reach of our deepest joys and highest happiness? I can't. I can only give you words that express the joy that I have. I couldn't even give you words that express the deep, deep, deep joy of Christ in my heart. It's untalk. You, you can't even speak of it. And just sit there and be still and know that you are. You are, Lord. And you are all, all things to me. Then in verse 15, the one who spoke with me had a gold measuring rod to measure the city and its gates and its wall. The city is laid out as a square and its length is as great as its width. And he measured the city with the rod, 1,500 miles its length and the width and height are equal. And he measured its wall, 72 yards according to human measurements, which are also angelic measurements. So that measurement would be a cubit, so then angels have the same cubit. That's, kind of, that's what he's saying. So here's this city, right? 1,500 miles in length, 1,500 miles in height, 1,500 miles in width. You know what that is? That's 3 billion square miles in size. Think of this. 3 billion square miles. Who'd want to put the heating system in for that? <laughs> it would take a few companies to do that. HVAC, no, none needed here, man. You'll never get enough duck work for that. Three billion square miles. That's an amazing thing. And, and, the, and the walls are 72 yards thick. Think of this. A football field is 100 yards. 72 yards. That's insane. And yet that's what it is. So this is a big city that will hold a lot of people. And you can read a whole bunch of different commentaries on it, and people have tried to figure out how much footage, like if, like, let's say, you know, 16 billion people go to heaven. If 16 billion people go to heaven, then it would still give everybody six miles of space between people in this city. That is a very, very big, big city. You know, it's, it's just... It's pretty wild to see what it's all about, but that's where we're going. And then he says what it's made of, verse 18. The material of the wall was jasper, and the city was pure gold like clear glass. And the foundation stones of the city were, all, they were adorned with every kind of precious stone. The first foundation stone was jasper, the second sapphire, the first caldoni, the fourth emerald, the fifth sardonyx, the sixth sardis, the seventh crystallite, the eighth beryl, the ninth topaz, 
and the tenth Cryophase, and the eleventh Jacinth, and the twelfth Amethyst. And the twelve gates were twelve pearls. Each one of the gates was a single pearl. And the city, the street of the city was pure gold like transparent glass. That's, that's an amazing thing. You think of how that sparkles. The colors, it's shining through heaven. Any suns or anything that's there uh, illuminating on it. We're going to find out what happens with that. But um, the brilliance of these gems... And this is really important. It speaks of the multicolored grace and wisdom of God. Multicolored. It's, we just looked at it in Genesis chapter 9 when God gave the rainbow. The rainbow means multicolored. It means manifold. Manifold grace of God. Look up when you see the colors dazzling in brilliance after the storm, backed by the white light, you're going to see this color, which you'd never seen before, and you're going to remember, my manifold grace of God, I'm remembering you. You're on my mind constantly. And when you see the brilliance of this new Jerusalem, and this, this, uh, it speaks of the multicolored grace of God. In Ephesians chapter 3, Paul says, Now through the church... The manifold wisdom of God should be made known to the rulers and authorities in all the heavenly realms. Manifold means multicolored. It speaks of God's brilliant multicolored wisdom, wisdom, and it flashes forth through all of eternity. And it's just an amazing uh, picture that's painted there. And it says the gates there, each gate was composed of a single pearl. That's amazing. A single pearl. There's got to be a big pearl. Right? And yet it speaks of, the pearl speaks of being born out of pain. A pearl, when a pearl is made, how's a pearl made? You get a a, a shallow clam and inside a a grain of sand gets inside there and it becomes irritating and it's irritating the clam. You know, here I'm just clamming around, a piece of sand's got to come inside me. And it's bugging me, it's bugging me, it's bugging me. This is really ticking me off. And then it starts to secrete a fluid over it. I'm going to coat that little piece of sand. You ain't bugging me no more. And it becomes a pearl. And you see the gates up there. Each one is a solid pearl. And it speaks of being born out of pain. And it's a beautiful, beautiful picture of how the redeemed have emerged like a beautiful pearl out of the pain of Jesus Christ. (coughs) Who retains scars in heaven? Jesus does. He's broken and he's battered and we realize we have been redeemed out of his pain. And this new Jerusalem will never let that be forgotten of the price that was paid for us. Jesus told the story of the pearl of great price and the kingdom of heaven is like a merchant looking for Find pearls. When he found one of great value, he went away, sold everything he had, and he bought it. And the merchant in that story is Jesus, who gave up everything. He gave up his privilege and his right as God. He gave up the worship due him, even his mortal life, in order to redeem us. He deemed us as a pearl of great price. He sold all that he had, including his life, to purchase you and I for himself. And we'll never forget that for all of eternity, ever. Because of the sacrifice that Jesus made to redeem us, the redeemed will never forget throughout all of eternity the pain and shame he faced for us on the cross. You know what we'll never forget? We'll never forget his love for us. Never. And that is a tremendous blessing. And again, this is where we're going. This is where we will spend eternity. And it's a great encouragement when you're facing difficulties while you're here in this, in this world. In verse 22, Then I saw no temple in it, for the Lord God the Almighty and the Lamb are its temple. And the city has no need of the sun or the moon to shine on it, for the glory of God has illuminated it, and its lamp is the Lamb. And the nations will walk by its light, and the kings of the earth will bring their glory into it. And in the daytime, there will be uh, no night there, because there will be no night, uh, and its gates will never be closed. 
And there they will bring the glory and honor of the nations to it, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. So he looks at this, this city, and, and there's no temple there. And it's probably being John, being a Jew, he's looking, if, if the city is this brilliant and dazzling, I wonder what the temple looks like. And yet there's no temple there because the true temple is the true God-man, Jesus Christ himself. He is the temple. The Father, the Lamb, you have, he is the temple of God. There's no need for the sun or the moon. You know, by him it speaks of uh, being illuminating things to see. The implication here is that there will be a sun and a moon in the new creation, but their illumination is not needed in this city because Christ illuminates it. By him, we will see all things clearly. There'll be no need for the sun or the moon's illumination because the, its lamp, he says, is the lamb. And, and so he is the light. You know, we think of this through scripture. Look at the book of John. He is the light. He is the door. He is the beauty. He's the joy of the glory of God. And he will be known as such for all of eternity. He is the illumination, the only illumination we'll ever need to see things clearly. And he says, and its gates will never be shut. You know why? There'll never be a need of protection or defense. Not never, because we cannot be harmed in this new world that's to come, so there's no need uh, for, for that, for the, for the gates to be closed at all. And then in verse 27, and nothing unclean and no one who practices abomination and lying shall ever come into it, but only those whose names are written in the Lamb's book of life. And what John is being showed here is that it's not that this evil people outside of the gates, you know, trying to get into the city. No, everybody's been thrown in the lake of fire. There are no evil people. This is for you and I today to understand. God is saying, listen, I don't care what you face in your life or what your struggles are. I want you to be in this city with me. I want you to be here. That's really important uh, that, that you come and be with me for all of eternity. And he's saying, so make a decision. Make sure you make that decision before your heart stops beating. Because if you haven't decided that and your heart stops beating, you will not be here. Because no one, no one who won't trust my son for their salvation will be allowed into this place. They're all going to be in the lake of fire. And that's a frightening thing. In, in, in Luke chapter 10, verse 19, Jesus said, look, I've given you the authority, he's talking to his disciples, I've given you the authority to trample snakes and scorpions to destroy all the enemy's power, and nothing will ever hurt you. However, he says, stop rejoicing because the spirits are submitting to you. Rather, rejoice because your names are written in heaven. Where? The Lamb's book of life. You rejoice because your name is written in the Lamb's book of life. I don't know about you, but I've talked to many people that were believers and, and they stumbled because they sin in their life and they go, well, maybe I was, I was written out of the Lamb's book of life. I'm probably not in there. I had a dream and they were going through all the M's and my name wasn't there. It was, I don't know what to say. Faith in Christ is what's written you in that Lamb's book of life. You put faith in Jesus Christ for your salvation. You don't have to feel it. You don't have to see stars. You have to trust by faith and your name's recorded right there. And anyone whose name is not recorded will not get to where we're going. Will never be a citizen of heaven ever. So we walk by faith, we trust in him. So really this chapter was written to you and I so that we would have hope as we face persecution, as we face trials, as we face tribulation in this world. We could press on knowing where we're going and because we want to be sure that our names are written in the Lamb's book of life and we go to other people and share with them too. Sometimes you share the gospel with somebody and they get all defensive, they get all mad because they think you, you're doing something wrong and you're like, stop. 
God wants you to be with him. And this is the only way to ever be with him. And this is where we'll spend eternity. And he wants you to be in this place. And that's done simply by putting faith in Jesus Christ. In John chapter 12, I'm going to read to you verse 44. Down, We read this in our church Bible reading yesterday. Jesus cried out and said, He who believes in me does not believe in me, but in him who sent me. He who sees me, the one who sent me, sees the one who sent me. I have come as light into the world, so that everyone who believes in me will not remain in darkness. If anyone hears my saying and does not keep them, I do not judge him, for I did not come to judge the world, but to save the world. He who rejects me and does not receive my sayings has one who judges him. The word I spoke is what will judge him on the last day. For I did not speak on my own initiative, but the Father himself who sent me has given me a commandment as to what to say and what to speak. And I know that his commandment is eternal life. Therefore, the things I speak, I speak just as the Father has told me. Jesus is giving John this picture to write down of what our eternal life in this new Jerusalem is going to be like. And then he lets us know who's not going to be there. Why? So first of all, we'd have the hope to know where we're going. And second of all, we might have the courage to share Christ with other people so they can go there too. Because if they reject him, they will not be there. And where they're going is a horrible, horrible, horrible place for all of eternity. So the chapter should give us a great hope to press on and endure in spite of all the things we face. Amen? Amen. Amen. Let's pray. Father, thank you for this time that you've given us to spend in your word. And I pray, Lord, you take your word that was taught today. Plant it deep in every heart. Let it be watered by your Holy Spirit so that it would take root there, Lord. It would begin to grow and, and produce all that you want it to. Lord, we love you. We thank you for this time. Just continue to lead us each and every day. We ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.